Hello, today is Friday, May 31st, 2024. I'm Tony Mangino from TC2, and this is Staying Connected. Longtime Staying Connected listeners have heard us discuss the Federal Communication Commission's proceedings on net neutrality for many years now. And now we have yet another update to this highly controversial and on again, off again issue. On today's podcast, we'll explain the FCC's latest action, formally reinstating a new set of net neutrality rules. And we'll also go over why enterprise customers of ICT services should care. Joining me today are two of my fellow enterprise colleagues, Steve Rosen and Sarah Kafazi of LB3, who specialize in telecom regulation. Steve, I just read that on July 22nd, the FCC's open internet order will take effect. What is the open internet or net neutrality all about? Good morning, Tony. It's always good to be talking telecom regulation with you. Net neutrality is a regulatory question of to what degree the FCC should regulate the ability of internet service providers to act as content neutral common carriers that must transport internet traffic in a non-discriminatory fashion, regardless of its origin or destination. Or to put it more simply, it is the concept that end users, either regular consumers or enterprises, get to decide what content they send or receive, and they select and pay their own ISP in order to do that. On the other side of the connection, entities that produce content do the same thing. They pick their own ISP and determine what type of service they want. So the concept is that everyone pays their own way and transmits and receives the content they want without any difference in treatment of that content by the ISPs. And the FCC recently decided to put into place formal rules meant to preserve net neutrality. What are the legal issues involved in determining the appropriate rules? Hi, Tony. So the core issue comes down to whether broadband internet access service, or BIAS for short, is a telecommunication service or an information service. As a matter of law, telecommunication services are what we call common carriage services, meaning the providers must transmit the user's selected information between points specified by the user and without any change in the form or content of the underlying information. In contrast, information services provide a transmission service with additional type capability, and that additional capability is for either generating, acquiring, storing, transforming, or processing, or you know, essentially doing something with the information that's transmitted in a way that transforms or modifies the content. So one example is email is classified as an information service. Telecommunication services are pretty heavily regulated under Title II of the Communications Act, while information services are pretty lightly regulated, if at all, under Title I of that same act. Okay, so what's really at conflict when it comes to these service types, and what's the impact on the open internet concept? So the main issue is what we call the terminating access monopoly that the ISP providing internet access to a customer has. So that ISP has total control over access into its customer's house or business, meaning it's the only way for that end user to receive or transmit information. Once a consumer picks its ISP, a monopoly of terminating access is created because that ISP is the gatekeeper. It's the only way content gets in or out of that consumer's devices, whether they're at home or are connected on a wireless basis. And the risk posed is that ISPs would try to take advantage of that monopoly and require content providers. And by that, we mean every business in America to pay to gain access to that customer. And the ISP is the gatekeeper to the customer, is probably not the content providing businesses selected ISP. So if the business wants to reach the customer, it has no choice but to satisfy the requirements that the ISP imposes. All right, got it. Now that we have a good amount of background in place, exactly what does this latest open internet order do? The crux of the order gets at limiting ways that ISPs can take advantage of that terminating access monopoly. And it does this by reimposing a number of requirements that have been fought over in prior rulings. And we've talked about these before, so they'll probably sound familiar. First, ISPs are prohibited from blocking lawful content, applications, and services from reaching the ISP's end user customer. Now, blocking was seen as the most extreme and probably least likely ISP behavior to occur, but the FCC took it off the table with these rules. Next, ISPs are prohibited from throttling, impairing, or degrading any content, apps, or services. Third, and perhaps the most relevant, is that ISPs are prohibited from engaging in what's called paid prioritization. And that's where an ISP would either directly or indirectly favor some traffic over other traffic, 
either in exchange for consideration, be it monetary or otherwise, from a third party, or to benefit an affiliated entity. And then on top of those big three items, the FCC also adopted a couple of other rules that should benefit consumers. So first, there's a new general conduct rule that prohibits ISPs from unreasonably interfering with or disadvantaging end users' abilities to select, access, and use the bias services or the lawful internet content apps, services, or devices of their choice, as well as edge providers' ability to make lawful content apps or services available to those end users. And then there's a transparency rule that requires ISPs to disclose their network management practices, performance, and the commercial terms of their bias services publicly. Are there any other requirements that internet access providers must comply with? Absolutely. The order officially classifies mobile internet access as a commercial mobile radio service, or CMRS, which is subject to Title II regulation. This is significant because there are many more entities providing mobile internet access than there were in 2015 including a number of automobile manufacturers that offer Wi-Fi hotspots to their vehicle owners as part of a subscription service. The order also subjects internet access providers to a number of existing Title II requirements, including the old-school common carrier provisions of Sections 201, prohibiting unjust and unreasonable practices, 202, prohibiting unreasonable discrimination, and 208, making common carriers subject to the FCC's complaint process. Section 214, requiring FCC consent to begin or end the provision of service, but the FCC granted blanket Section 214 authority to enter the market for internet access to all current and future internet access providers, subject to the Commission's reserved power to revoke such authority, and with respect to certain previously sanctioned Chinese entities. Section 222, which imposes a general duty to maintain confidentiality of customer proprietary network information, or CPNI. Section 224, governing network attachments and right-of-way, which provide telecommunications carriers, including internet access providers, with regulated access to poles, ducts, conduits, and rights-of-way. Section 255, requiring access to telecommunications services and customer premises equipment by people with disabilities, where readily achievable. Section 332C, which preempts state rate regulation for wireless services and state barriers to constructing wireless facilities. Section 229, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, or CALEA, which requires telecommunications networks to be engineered to allow court-ordered intercepts. Significantly, however, and a major point of contention, the Commission will not require providers of Internet Access Service to contribute to any federal funds including the Universal Service Fund. This might have been a missed opportunity for the Commission to rationalize the Universal Service Contribution System, as it has been estimated that subjecting Internet access to universal service charges would reduce the contribution factor from approximately 35% to approximately 5%. Steve, that is a heaping helping of Title II there. But based on what I know about wireless IoT applications and other machine-to-machine applications, I'm not sure that those requirements are practical. You know, the FCC seems to have read your mind, Tony. In the open internet order, it chose not to regulate network slicing or machine-to-machine mobile data services as mobile internet access services. But the commission did reserve the right to do so in the future if the services become functionally equivalent to mass market internet access services. This is a significant win for 5G providers because network slicing is an important feature of this technology. Another interesting aspect of the open internet order is that it did not discuss the regulatory status of direct internet access, which some carriers treat as a telecommunications service, others treat as an information service, and still others treat as part telecommunications service and part information service. Interesting stuff, Steve. So, Sarah, what does the future hold? Well, as with past (laughs) orders, we'll expect to see legal challenges to this order as soon as the rules are officially on the books. That means net neutrality will continue to be in the news as debates play out in the courts. And of course, 2024 is a presidential election year, and the new administration will appoint an FCC chair who will either leave the open internet order largely undisturbed or once again reclassify internet access as a largely unregulated information service. So while the open internet is not ranked high among voter concerns, it is in any effect on the 2024 ballot. Thanks, Sarah. I'll be sure to remember that when I vote. If you're interested in learning more about net neutrality or how these rules affect your business, 
or how to join with other businesses to make sure you don't become a newfound revenue source for your customers' ISPs, don't hesitate to reach out to Sarah, Steve, or to any of the LB3 or TC2 professionals with whom you regularly work. And you can always stay up to date by subscribing to our Staying Connected podcast, by checking out our websites, and by following us on LinkedIn.